that when I think about what the Lord has done for me just in this week alone, when I think about the God that was there for me on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday, the God that was with me on Thursday and Friday and Saturday, that when I get up on Sunday morning and put my clothes on, I come with the intention to give the Lord the greatest praise that I have. It's nice to see you. I'm glad that you're here too. But when I walk in the door, I come to give God praise on Sunday morning. Anybody feel like me? Come on, let's release this sound. Praise Him. Praise Him. Yeah. We come to praise Him. That's why I'm here today. Somebody call his name, bless his name. What a wonderful name to call Jesus. Bless his name for that he is certainly a blessed Savior. Greetings in the excellent name of Jesus. It is my prayer that you have the joy of the Lord in your heart. Of course, you know I am the pastor here at the A Street Church. And it's just 
a joy to be able to come before you once again. Thank you so much for tuning in and sharing with us as we try to um, share the word of the Lord with you on this day that the Lord has made. Please do me a favor, I always ask this. Invite family, friends, neighbors, enemies, co-workers, whomever. Y'all come and join in. Tell them that the A Street um, Bible study is going on and we want to be a blessing unto them. Uh, when you log in, um, give us a shout. You know, say hello, how you doing? You know, come in an agreement, say amen. But however, when you log in, um, we want to make sure that we see you. And thank you so much for logging in on today. It's just that we have so much going on within our personal lives. We have so much going on in the business world and in the world of education, the world of athletics, the world of, of politics. It does seem like that we just have so much going on within our personal lives. Some that affects our lives directly, some that affect our lives indirectly. But regardless, we have so much that's going on. And so we just want to um, come to you in a way that we will be a blessing unto you. And what I'm talking about is that while we're so much, so much going on, we have to be able to uh, negotiate our schedules. We have to be able to negotiate um, the the busyness of our schedule. And so, what we end up doing is that we make things a priority, or we prioritize the things that we are going through you know we may have to take care of people or persons who are sick people or persons uh, who are under age you know our children our nephew our nieces or somebody else's child you know, we we have to take care of ourselves and so we have to prioritize uh, these things we have our jobs we have our places where we volunteer at um, so we have so much just just going on and so as you try to navigate through all of these things um, you must try to make things on or place life or put life or prioritize shall I say the things in life in order for you to have a sense of mind uh, because of the volume of actions of activity um, um, we can our mind can be convoluted with so much stuff um, so it's imperative that we prioritize organize our thoughts and our actions so that we don't lose our minds so that we're not stressed out to the degree that we will have a mental breakdown, that we would not um, be so stressed out until we don't have any time for ourselves, that we just cannot enjoy life. And uh, we have so much, you know, sometimes uh, the weight of our, our responsibilities has the potential to, um, to uh, stress us out to the degree that not only do we lack self-care, but we're just stressed out and we can't rest. And so that's a bad place to be in. You know, when you do not take care of yourself, when you can't, as you think that you cannot take care of yourself, uh, that's a bad place to be in. And so self-care is highly important. I think that when we study the life of Jesus, um, he took time out of his busy schedule, his hectic schedule, 
and he would attend to himself by way of prayer. Prayer was a way of escape. Prayer was a way of refreshing. Prayer was um, priority within his life. And like I said earlier, because he made it a priority in his life, prayer, uh, he was able to uh, take care of himself. And so it's imperative that we follow that pattern or we learn from Jesus how to uh, escape from the daily issues of life, the things that are so stressful, the things that are so hectic. Uh, put a priority tag on that. And so some things can just wait. Um, some jobs can just wait. And uh, you need to go ahead and to attend to yourself. And that's the kind of world that we live in. We live in a, you know, time is of the essence. We live in that kind of a, of a world where time is such a precious commodity. And we need to be able to understand, you know, that when we give people our time, we give them of ourselves. And when you don't have time uh, for yourself, it is because that you've given it to someone else or to some other thing. And so now you find yourself in a bad position. But I'm saying all of this to say this is that we need to be able to come to a point to where we prioritize things in our lives so that we can have balance in our lives. And one of the things that helps us to understand that is the scriptures. Is the scriptures. The scriptures, especially James, um, he says this, that put make prayer a priority make prayer a priority you know make your faith a priority and one of the reasons why you can make your faith priority is through prayer um that's a more accurate statement that james teaches us is that we need to be able to make our faith our priority because faith is that which satisfies god and it doesn't take much, it doesn't take much, but however, it does take a position within our lives, within faith. If we have faith, we can speak, we can do that which is impossible. But while things, while we are responsible for the possible, God is responsible for that which is impossible. But we have to be able to practice or be able to make faith our priority. And uh, let's see what James has to say about this because James, uh, uh, he simply says that our faith should be our priority as believers. As believers, faith should be our priority. So let's take our Bibles and let's go to James chapter 4. And let's start at verse number 13. He says, Come now, you who say tomorrow, or today, or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, but what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, shall we live and do this or that? But now you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So, James speaks about, you know, how that we should not boast and brag as we make tomorrow, as, as if tomorrow is certain, as if tomorrow is certain. And when we boast and brag, uh, we take that for granted that tomorrow we will participate inside of tomorrow. That we're going to have things to do on tomorrow. 
And James is saying to us, that's not always the case. Don't boast and brag that you can do things on tomorrow. But what you should be saying, hey, if the Lord's will, I will be able to do these things. And, and the reason why that he's saying that is because you are including God in your planning. That you are acknowledging God in your planning versus you have no acknowledgement or no reference or reverencing God for your future. Say our future is not guaranteed. Your tomorrow is not guaranteed. It is only if God allows your tomorrow, amen, to be available. So James teaches us this is that our faith should be priority versus our plans. Our faith should be priority versus our plans. Now he does not say that planning is not important. He does not say not to plan. But what he is saying is that in your planning, you need to acknowledge the will of God. That you need to acknowledge the will of God. Because it may not be in the will of God for your plans to come through. We've seen this time and time again, but it really hasn't hit us. And the fact that we need to make God priority. People have died suddenly. People have died unexpectedly. People have died, amen, uh, immediately. No one planned for their death. But then you have people who, in their lives, they planned for death. They made out their wills. They made out their order of service. They planned their funeral. And they have done a number of arrangements have made a number of arrangements those people or persons have planned but even then they're not quite sure what day or what hour uh, things like this are going to happen and so when we plan for our future um, the question is is that when we're wrong about our future, how do we handle being wrong? How do we respond being wrong? Because James in his book teaches us that as we plan for the future, and once again, planning for the future is important. But our faith should be priority. And so James teaches us uh, as we plan for our future, we ought to acknowledge the will of God. And that's three things that James wants to share with us. You know, when it comes to making faith our priority. first thing that, that he does that he says to us is that our plans are subject to God's will our plans are subject to God's will uh, verses 13 through 17 helps us to understand that our plans are subject to God's will you know I've said this and I keep saying that there's nothing wrong with planning. Planning is necessary. We plan to succeed and, and without planning, we plan to fail. So planning is very important. You know, Jesus, he taught within his parables about the valuable, how valuable planning is. Um, 
in particular the parable of the virgins. Um, the, 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 he said there was wise virgin virgins, there were foolish virgins, and those who was wise, uh, they planned ahead by putting uh, oil in their lamps. And those he called wise. So it's wise to plan. But then there was those virgins who did not put oil in their lamp. So therefore, when the master came, uh, they did not have any oil. And so Jesus calls those persons foolish. So it's foolish for us not to plan not to plan. So when we plan ahead, that's wisdom. When we fail not to plan, that's foolishness. But although that we are to practice wisdom, our wisdom of planning is still subject to the will of God. Our will, amen, uh, is subject to the will of God. You know, Jesus, when Jesus told the people or persons, you know, if you want to follow me, you need to count the cost. That's wisdom. But although that you're to walk in wisdom by counting the cost, you still have to understand that your wisdom is subject to God's will. And so planning is a sound practice of life. We plan, we plan for our children, we plan for the children's education, we plan for the children's uh, financial success for the most part. A wise person always leaves an inheritance for his children. You know, how does that happen? By planning. We plan, we plan, we plan, we plan, we plan, we plan for whatever area in our lives. But no matter how well we plan, listen now, our plan is still subject to God's will. You know, James says, you know, these people were planning, these persons was planning to go into the city to make money. There's nothing wrong with that. They had a sound plan. But then James says that, listen, although their plans were sound, they were still subject to the will of God. Instead of saying what we're going to do, they should have been saying, according to James, if the Lord's will. Hmm. I don't know if I'm going to see you on tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to see you on a Sunday. I don't know if I'm going to see you, amen, tonight or tomorrow. But if the Lord's will, I shall see you in the near future, whether it be tomorrow, whether it be Sunday, whether it be next week, I may see you on a Saturday. I may see you on a Thursday. But the only way that you're going to see me is that it has to be the Lord's will. Only God knows the future. And only God is infallible. We can exercise the best wisdom, but we are still subject to to God's will. And it's those people or persons, according to what James says, that you make plans without considering God's will. He says that you're boasting and you're bragging. Then he says that boasting and bragging is sin. Mm. It's sin because you fail to acknowledge who God is. Wait till I see you next time. 
And for the most part, we don't even think about it. It just comes naturally when I see you again. The next time that we hook up, we just walk into the future because we take the future for granted. And while tomorrow is so brief, listen to what he says, is that it is so brief that it is what? Like a vapor. It's like a vapor. We don't know what's going to happen. What is your life? It's a vapor. It's just for a little time. You know, it's just like it's dew on the ground. And by noontime, that dew has um, evaporated. It has dissipated because of the heat of the sun. It goes. And so that's what he's saying to us. And we walk in that way. And we need to be conscious of the way that we walk. Because when we walk, we're boasting and bragging. And arrogance considering not considering the will of God all of us are guilty I'm guilty I'm telling you when this particular uh, verse uh, hit me again and I'm when I say that it hit me again, it hit me from the simple fact that when we celebrated Black History, um, uh, uh, Pastor Emeritus, 92 years old, Alfred Davis. Wow. With all of that energy, that vim and vigor, vitality, the, the sharpness of the mind, the ability to move without a king and we're talking about hey can't wait to be that age and to be like him well we may not make it to we may not make it to be 92 we may not make it to have that type of mind we may not make it to have that type of uh, a movement and activity of our limbs. But if the Lord's will, are you seeing what I'm saying? Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so therefore, you know, life is precious. It's fragile. We should plan. But all of our plans are subject to God's will. In other words, we do not put our trust in plans. We put our trust in God. So not only are our plans subject to God's will, but secondly, listen now, we're to focus on his return. We're to focus on the Lord's return. We're to focus on his return. Now verses 5 through 7 and chapter 5 helps us to understand listen the Lord is coming back we may be living a good life we may be living the best life we may be about a certain life we may be about that life but whatever life that we are living we need to focus on the Lord's return in other words he is coming back Yes, he is. He's, he's coming back. He's coming back not because that I said it. He's coming back because he said it in his word. Listen, James chapter 5, verses uh, 7 through 9. Verse 7 says, listen, therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patient, patiently for it to come until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, 
for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing there at the door. Lord have mercy. So, once again, we are to be planning for the expectation, with the expectation, that the Lord is coming back. The Lord is coming back. So therefore he says be patient. Whew. The question is, have you been patient? You know, when you start looking at verses 1 through 6, you'll learn that how, um, that how James criticized the rich for gaining their wealth off the back of those workers who they hired and they found themselves living the high life. They gained riches off slavery, off the back of those which were oppressed. They gained riches. They lived a certain lifestyle. They were beneficiaries of those who were mm, underpaid, overworked, who did not receive a fair wage. Where am I going with this? Stick with me because I'm going somewhere. In other words, James criticized those who used the system of slavery system of sharecropping to oppress certain people so that they can live a certain lifestyle and the people or persons whom they oppressed took advantage of pushed them down to a certain degree so there was no equality are you hearing what I'm saying? In other words, when white folk took advantage of black folk, now are you understanding what I'm saying? James is telling us right here in chapter five, those persons who became rich off the backs of the free labor for the hands that worked tirelessly in order to elevate their lifestyle. Can I repeat myself? There was no equality, but there was oppression and suppression. So James says that when those certain people earn their wealth in that particular fashion, he was very critical and he says, and he considered them like unjust farmers, unjust farmers. The unjust farmer, he controlled his workers with unjust practices, but what he could not control was that of the rain. Lord have mercy. James is saying those particular persons needed to depend on God because they could never anticipate what was going to happen in the future. God was still in control. Lord have mercy. So, because that God was the only one that could produce the rain. And without the rain, they could not be successful. Without the rain, the farms could not survive. But if the rain came, and it did come, the crops will flourish. Why? Because the rain was essential to the harvest. 
no matter how unfair it was, no matter how unjust they were, they could not control the rain. And the rain was the essential component of the, of the farmer and his crops to be successful. So only God can send the rain. And so we are dependent on what God can do. We are dependent on what God will do. We are dependent on what God shall do and all that we need and all that we have. It really comes from God. And he uses a very interesting metaphor. He says, now the patient farmer, he knows that. So he waits patiently for God to send the rain to nourish his crops. And James is declared, the farmer waits for this precious fruit on the earth and is patient with it until it receives that rain which is early or that rain which is late. Regardless of what time the rain came, it was essential for the harvest. So therefore he trusts in God to send the right amount of rain so that his particular crop would be successful. Now, so James says, just like the, the farmer who is patiently waiting on the Lord to send the rain, we too are to be patiently waiting on the Lord for his return. Because there's benefits of the rain. And just like there's benefits of the rain, there's benefits in his return. We shall all reign with him. When he comes, there'll be no more sickness, no more disease, no more dying, no more crying. The wicked shall cease from troubling when he comes. When the rain comes, we shall be like him. It is yet to see what we will become like individually, but collectively and generally speaking, we all shall be like him, Christ-like. So, James says that the coming of the Lord is near and the farmer who's patient, he has an attitude that exemplifies that as we wait on the coming of the Lord, that we all have something to rejoice about. Yes, sir. So, when we make faith our priority, number one, our plans are subject to God's will. Number two, we are to focus on the Lord's return. And then number three, we are to stay the course. Don't change our course, but stay the course. Chapter 5, verses 10 through 11, helps us to understand that we are to stay the course. Listen, my brethren, chapter, verse 10, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endureth. You have heard of the preservation of Job and seen the end entreated by the Lord that the Lord is a very compassionate and merciful. That the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Lord have mercy. 
So therefore, we are to stay the course. In other words, by being patient, by trusting in the Lord, even when we face difficulties or challenges in life, James says, stay the course. Don't change up. Don't become brand new on God. Stay the course. Stay. Have love in your heart. Walk in the joy of the Lord. Be a, a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemaker. You know, don't change up on God. You know, blessed are they that are reviled or persecuted for his sake. Stay the course. Love your neighbors as you love yourself. Give and it shall be given unto you. Stay the course. Pray in season and out of season. Stay the course. You know, worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Stay the course. He says, don't change. Mm -hmm. We know what they're doing. Those who are not of God, those who are unsaved, we know what they're doing. And it's fun. And they are enjoying the prosperity. But as a believer, stay the course. You know, there's an old saying, serving the Lord. It will pay off. After a while, just keep on trusting every day and whatever is right. God promised he would pay. Stay the course. Don't 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 change up. You know, the pandemic, it caused many of us to become virtual worshipers. But now we're on the backside of the pandemic. He's saying, stay the course. Go back to church. Don't forsake the assembly of yourselves. I mean, you go everywhere else. Go back to church. Stay, stay the course. Don't change up on God. Don't change. Because you, you, you can't work your way into heaven. But you can serve your way into heaven. Jesus is still Lord. Don't, don't stay the course. This is the day that the Lord has made. Stay the course. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. Stay the course. Whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is kind, Think on these things. Stay the course. Don't, don't, don't change. Because he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. One of the best examples of staying the course is Job. Lost everything. His friends came and judged him. His children was killed in the storm. His wife encouraged him to, to curse at him and die. But not one time in all of his questions to God, he never blamed God. But he did question God. God, why does this, is this happening to me? God responded. And John, Job says, okay. But not one time did he point the finger at God. Stay the course. Sickness in my body. Stay the course. Divorce. Stay the course. Children going astray. Gone. People stab you in the, in the back. You know, lost your job. Stay the course. You know, 
your house is foreclosed, um, your car has been repossessed or total, uh, but yet stay the course. Because when you stay the course, hmm, listen, there is a reward for you. And that reward that God gives to you, hmm, the world can't take it away. So, if you will stay the course, you and I will receive God's approval. So, as I get ready to close, as we endure hardships, you know, see the griffin and spalding, these tornadoes, stay the course. And we stay the course by making faith our priority. When faith is our priority, other things come into play. And so, when we make our plans, we understand that our plans are subject to the will of God. And as we live our lives, we live with anticipation that the Lord is going to return. But yet, while we don't know what the future is going to hold, there's no guarantee we will respond to ad adversities of life by staying the course. Lord have mercy. So we're going to pray with the praise. We're going to pray over our plans that God will endorse our plans. We're going to trust God knowing that his return is going to bring the justice and the freedom that we need. Because we have made faith our priority. Lord have mercy in Jesus name. Well, that's all that I have to share with you. But that was a very intense lesson that caused you to sit down and to evaluate the things of life. Sit down and to be able to look at yourself from a view that you've never considered before, from an angle which you've never seen. Make faith your priority. Amen. Listen, very quickly. Um, this coming Thursday, I need to meet with the deacons, trustees, and finance as we prepare for our conference that's going to be on this Saturday at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock membership is encouraged to attend um, but however on Thursday deacons trustees finance persons uh, we need to meet at 7 p.m. on Thursday please understand that on Saturday March the 11th at 10 a.m. we're going to um, go back to meeting or try to explain to you the values of small group ministry small group ministry we need leaders we need persons who are willing to lead these small groups so that we can become more effective within our faith and also within the ministry itself we had a wonderful time with the children this past sunday um, springtime is coming up Easter is coming up uh, we are encouraging you um, to uh, get your children involved um, we're going to have a contact person um, at the moment is Joanne Middlebrooks uh, we don't know her her, her number uh, escapes me right now but 
Joanne Middlebrook, she's the, um, the contact for our Easter uh, program as we celebrate our Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Uh, Cane Creek Baptist Association, once again, if you have seniors in your household, those particular forms, the application can be picked up uh, in the church office on Sunday or um, what better yet, turn, the deadline is March the 12th. The deadline is March the 12th. Um, so pick up those forms, complete them, and, um, and um, we will um, submit those persons' names uh, to the board so that we can acknowledge them by way of scholarship. All right? Math. Okay. Um, and lastly, it is my prayer that we will meet and see one another on this coming Sunday at 9.45 a.m. 9.45 a.m. We want to get started on time so that we can leave on time as well. Man, it's been a pleasure once again, as well as a joy, to be able to meet with you once again. So the clock on the wall says that's all. And as I give this benediction, I'm asking that you would receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and lift up his countenance before you. May the Lord mm -hmm, uh, lift up his countenance. I'm sorry. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance before you. And may the Lord give you his peace. His peace. Now go there in peace. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Deuces. <laughs>